Ladies and gentlemen, hi, welcome to LawCaseUK.com. Today I'm going to be looking at the 2002 case of Thoburn and Sunderland City Council. It's a case that um, arises in the Divisional Court and, in effect, it's actually for conjoined appeals by way of case dated from the Magistrates' Courts. In three of the cases, there, the appeals arise from a criminal prosecution and in the remaining case it arises because a trader makes a complaint to the Magistrates' Court in relation to specific conditions that have been imposed upon his trading licence. Now, in the first case, at first instance, that of Thoburn, the case is heard before District Judge Morgan, and his decision is then made available in the remaining cases. So we see some similarity of outcome in this respect. In the Divisional Court, the judgment is given by Lord Justice Laws, and it's that judgment that I'm going to be looking at today. So if we begin, as we often do, by looking at the facts, in all cases here, the appellants were denied the opportunity to sell goods using the traditional British imperial weight system, such as pounds and ounces. And instead, they were required to use the metric system emanating from the European Union, namely kilograms and grams. Now, as Lord Justice Lords himself identified, this had the potential to be a particularly dry subject for consideration. However, um, it was something that had aroused quite a degree of feeling in certain quarters in the country. Now, I'm going to try and explain the case while at the same time keeping the explanation of these various regulatory measures to a minimum, because there are quite a lot of them that crop up in the judgment itself. So here goes. Historically, um, the 1985 Weights and Measures Act allowed the use of either imperial or metric measures. But this was amended over time by secondary legislation, which eventually removed the right to use imperial measures in the majority of instances. Primarily, although not exclusively, but primarily the authority for the amending secondary legislation came from the European Communities Act of 1972. And obviously, this act predates the Weights and Measures Act by some 13 years. Now, our examination begins by looking at the ECA 1972, which, by its most well-known provision, Section 2.1, allows for EU law to be given legal effect within domestic law. But a little less well known is the provision under section 2, subsection 2. Now this says, at any time after its passing, Her Majesty may, by ordering council, and any designated minister or department may, by regulations, make provision, a, for the purpose of implementing any community obligation of the United Kingdom, or enabling any such obligation to be implemented or of enabling any rights enjoyed or to be enjoyed by the United Kingdom under or by virtue of the treaties to be exercised. So, in effect, secondary legislation may be used to give effect to EU law, and by way of Section 2.4, this power can be used to amend even primary legislation. So... As Lord Justice Laws identified, um, and I quote, by force of its very sovereignty, Parliament may delegate the power of amendment or repeal. And the provision by which such power is delegated to the executive is, as you may well know, referred to as a Henry VIII clause. And Section 2.2 of the ECA is such a clause. Now, the appellants made a number of arguments in support of their cases, which to the effect was they should be allowed to use um, imperial measures. But I'm going to focus on the one key argument, as indeed I think the court did. Now this argument involves the doctrine of implied repeal, which arises from the principle that no parliament is bound by its predecessor. Um, a key aspect of parliamentary sovereignty, if you like. So no parliament is bound by its predecessor, and in a nutshell, this means that if a later statute is inconsistent with an earlier one, then the later is taken to have impliedly repealed the inconsistent provisions in the former statute. Now, the appellant's argument, 
was that Section 1 of the 1985 Act, as enacted, impliedly repealed the ECA power to make any amendment by way of subordinate legislation. Any of that power that would be inconsistent with the 1985 Act, they said, was impliedly repealed. Accordingly, um, Section 1 must be taken to have forbidden any um, amendment by means of Section 2.2 to the 85 Act, which would prohibit the continued use of both imperial and metric measures um, for the purposes of trade. And that was um, the default position in 1985. And um, the appellants argued that it was impossible for an earlier Act to um, change that in any way um, at all. Now, inherent in this argument on implied repeal is the proposition that a Henry VIII power to amend primary legislation could only lawfully be exercised in relation to acts already on the statute book at the time when the Henry VIII power is created. So, for example, in the ECA, only those already on the statute book in 1972. But this in a practical sense, creates a crucial difficulty for the appellants. Now, in opposing the appellants' arguments, Respondent Council noted the example of a similar Henry VIII clause in the Human Rights Act of 1998. And, as you probably know, this Act confers a power on the executive to take remedial action um, where a court has made a direction and direct declaration of incompatibility under section 4. Section 10 is the amending provision and section 4 allows the court to make the declaration of incompatibility. Um, and in looking at this, Lord Justice Laws accepted that the intended operation of section 10 of the Human Rights Act was to include statutes yet to be passed. Otherwise, if this wasn't the case, an essential part of the structure of the Human Rights Act would be, as he said, consigned to the correction of historic violations, and that would um, not comply with the purpose of the Human Rights Act. So the alternative would be to conclude that any future acts of Parliament which violates convention rights must be taken to have impliedly repealed those sections in the Human Rights Act that purport to auth authorise amendment of the Act in question, the later Act. So, not surprisingly, Lord Justice Lords rejected this potential consequence and found that there was actually no inconsistency between Section 1 of the 1985 Act and Section 2.2 of the ECA. Um, and as Lord Justice Law said, generally there is no inconsistency between a provision conferring a Henry VIII power to amend future legislation and the terms of any future legislation. So that's the ratio for his decision. There was no conflict between the 1985 Act and the earlier Henry VIII clause. Um, but he didn't stop there. In a section in the judgment that he entitled Further Arguments on Re Implied Repeal, Lord Justice Laws then went on to deal with a submission from Respondents' Council which was to the effect of this. The EC Treaty was not like other international treaties. It created a new and so far unique legal order, supreme above the legal systems of the member states, so that upon accession to the community by force of the ECA, the United Kingdom bowed its head to this supremacy. One consequence was that while the Parliament of the United Kingdom retained the legal power to repeal the ECA by express legislation, it could not do so impliedly. So Respondent Council was making a challenge to the doctrine of implied repeal in these circumstances. In effect, to this extent, what they were arguing was that the ECA had entrenched EU law um, as EU law required itself to be. But Lord Justice Law's disagreed that EU law could entrench itself or that the 1972 Parliament had the legal ability to create such an entrenchment. And he said this because, of course, it's a principle of parliamentary sovereignty that no Parliament can bind its successor. 
So Parliament lacked that um, power to do that. And it's key here to recognise that he was saying that this is beyond the power of parliamentary sovereignty in order to do this. But because recognising this, he did not dismiss the idea completely out of hand. Instead, he found that the 1972 Act had indeed become entrenched to the extent that the respondents contended. But here's the twist, not through the force of EU law or through um, statute or parliamentary intention, but via the common law. And specifically, he said this, and of course, by this stage, we're dealing with comments potentially uh, um, by way of obiter. He said the common law has in recent years allowed, or rather created, exceptions to the doctrine of implied repeal, a doctrine which was always the common law's own creation. There are now classes or types of legislative provision which cannot be repealed by mere implication. These instances are given and can only be given by our own courts, to which the scope and nature of parliamentary sovereignty are ultimately confided. So... The scope of parliamentary sovereignty rests with the courts. Entrenchment lies not in sovereignty, but in the common law. And he goes on to develop his judgment in this way. In the present state of its maturity, the common law has come to recognise that there exist rights which should properly be classified as constitutional or fundamental. And so he, the common law has recognised these constitutional or fundamental rights. And here he refers to a number of cases in support, one of which would be the 2000 case of Sims, which would be crucial in this respect. And he continues. And from this, a further insight follows. We should recognise a hierarchy of acts of Parliament, as it were, ordinary statutes and constitutional statutes. In my opinion, a constitutional statute is one which, A, conditions the legal relationship between citizen and state in some general overarching manner, or B, enlarges or diminishes the scope of what we would now regard as fundamental constitutional rights. He then says, ordinary statutes may be impliedly repealed, constitutional statutes may not. So for laws, the status of constitutional statutes follows the state's special status of constitutional rights. Now, Laws gives us some example of constitutional statutes. He gives the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, the Act of Union, the Reform Acts, the Human Rights Act, the Scotland Act, and the Government of Wales Act, and of course, importantly, the European Communities Act of 1972. He then goes on, having identified um, this restriction, um, or this existence of these constitutional guarantees and hierarchy of statutes, he considers the broader constitutional consequences of what um, he is suggesting here. And he says as follows, the development of the common law regarding constitutional rights, and as I would say, constitutional statutes, is highly beneficial. It gives us most of the benefits of a written constitution in which fundamental rights are accorded special respect but it preserves the sovereignty of the legislature and the flexibility of our uncodified constitution. And I'll say a little bit more about that balance at the end, but before I do, I just want to identify um, some propositions that Lord Justice Laws does when he concludes his judgment. Because in concluding, he identifies four propositions which he thought sets out the necessary balance between the supremacy of EU law on the one hand and parliamentary supremacy on the other. And forgive me for reading again, but these crucially are as follows. One, all the specific rights and obligations which EU law creates are by the ECA incorporated in our, into our domestic law and rank supreme. That is, anything in our substantive law inconsistent with any of these rights and oblig obligations is abrogated or must be modified to avoid the consistency. This is true even where the inconsistent municipal provision is contained in primary legislation. And elsewhere we would have seen that, for example, in the fact of tame case. 
The second thing he identifies is that the ECA is a constitutional statute. That is, it cannot be impliedly repealed. And that's the gist of his judgment here, of course. The truth of that second prop proposition, he says at proposition number three, is derived not from EU law, but purely from the law of England. The common law recognises a category of constitutional statutes. And finally, his fourth proposition is this, the fundamental legal basis of the United Kingdom's relationship with the EU rests with the domestic, not the European legal powers. So, wow, in a potentially dry case about weights and measures, Lord Justice Laws sets out the relationship between the European Union and parliamentary supremacy, and in doing so, he finds in the common law constitutional guarantees, rights and statutes that are beyond the doctrine of implied repeal. Now, although, of course, strictly obiter in the divisional court, Law's notion of constitutional guarantees has been adopted by the United Kingdom Supreme Court and um, see, for example, the 2014 case of HS2 for an example of this. So um, this has um, quite a degree of force in law these days. Um, it follows, of course, from Lord Justice Law's judgment that um, it's no longer correct to suggest that as Dicey did, of course, that all statutes are equal any longer. Um, you might recall that Dicey said, um, neither the Act of Union with Scotland nor the Dentists Act of 1878 has more claim than any other to be considered su a supreme law. That statement can no longer to be taken as accurate. But what I think is important to reflect on just at the end is that all of this having been said, the case does nothing to directly question the ability of Parliament to repeal fundamental aspects by express repeal. And, of course, at the time I make this video, Parliament is poised to do exactly that in relation to the European Communities Act, to repeal it by express provision. And nothing in the case of Thoburn affects that ability.